EOC. I see your football jerseys out there. Oh no, Antonio Brown didn't. Hey, y'all doing all right? Good, my name's Matt and uh, I'm executive pastor here at COC. A couple things I wanted to highlight uh, today for you guys. First of which is, if you're a guest of ours, we wanna say thanks for coming to COC. We are so excited to hear it. Hey, give a guest a hand this morning. Wanted to let you know that we have a special gift for you today at the guest services area in the lobby. Make sure that you stop by there. Also, if you're a regular attender, just wanted to remind you that uh, if and when you are a giver uh, financially at COC, we have many ways that you can do that. You can do that through your envelopes and your programs today. You can also do that via text at 555-888, or you can uh, do that online at any time. Thank you so, so much for your generosity, man. It keeps uh, the AC on and and uh, us able to do the ministries that God has called us to do here in Maricopa. Man, he is doing some amazing, amazing things. Hey, where's the ladies at this morning? Any ladies out in the house? Women's retreat coming up September 27th to 29th. This is in Williams. Williams is a little community, if you're new to Arizona, close to Flagstaff. And it is the most beautiful camp facility that I've ever been to. There's heated floors. I mean, it's ridiculous. Great food, amazing gals. If you're looking for friendships and or to start new ones, we would love for you to be able to attend. If you have questions about that, you can uh, visit the retreat table and ask your questions there. But we would love for you to be able to go and spend time with the Lord and watch him do something really spectacular in your life. And last but not least, in your programs, if you have a, uh, one of these cards, Feed My Starving Children, go ahead and pull that out really quick. We are trying to fill up the next opportunity where uh, we get to go to this ministry called Feed My Starving Children. We actually uh, put together these uh, prepackaged food packages that go to serve hungry kids all across the world. And I believe if Joel's in the room, we're trying to get like 100 people to show up. That's Joel looking at me. Hey, sit down, dude. What are you doing right now? If you ain't got a Vikings shirt on, don't even talk right now, okay? I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm at Cardinals. No, anyway, but uh, Feed My Starving Children, uh, we would love for you to be a part of this. It takes literally nothing for you to serve at this. No gifts or abilities. It's just a, a willing heart, and it's amazing what God will do in you as you serve someone else. Does that sound all right? Hey, you guys ready to be at church today? Why don't you stand to your feet? Let's sing a little bit, everybody. Right, it's going to be an awesome day. Let's go ahead and uh, get our hands together. Here we go. Come on. Yeah. Woo. When night has fallen, when fear is calming, still you're calling me. Yeah. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength when my mind says i'm not good enough god you're enough for me yeah i've decided i'm not giving up you won't give up on me you won't give up on me your love is holding on and it won't let go yeah. i feel it breaking out like an echo Love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. Come on. So. In every season, you keep repeating promises to me. Now there's no stopping what you have started until it is complete. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let I feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. Echo in my soul. Hey. Soul. In my soul. 
feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out, breaking out. Hey, hey. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. Worship you, Jesus. Yes. Like a covenant of old, your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. The mercy for today, faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me.
at this time we do Second Sunday prayer. Well, we want you guys to come up and we're going to have the prayer team available. When you're grinding and going through stuff, this is a good time to be able to connect with God and a, and a team that really focuses on being able to pray specific and big prayers with you for healing. Hosea chapter 6 verses 3 and 4 says that let us acknowledge God. And then it reemphasizes the same sentence, in it, but it adds a word. It says, let us press on to acknowledge God. And then it says, just as surely as the sun rises, God promises to be there. See, you're going through something right now. I don't know what it is. Some of the team members probably don't know what it is. But we want you to come down here at this moment to be able to experience some healing today. We want you to come down and be able to experience some joy, maybe for the first time ever, for the first time in a long time. We're going to pray right now. And at that moment, we want you to come down and be able to experience that. Will you join me for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, God, we are so in love with you. We want to be engulfed in your joy in your peace, Lord. God, I pray in a local church like this that you've given to us, that you reach the heart of the lost, you reach the heart of the broken here today, that you use a church like COC to be able to bring your presence for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time. God, you're so good. We want to continue to thank you in prayer, God. We love you. And we're going to worship you in the highs and we're going to worship you in the lows. And when we press on, God, you have promised to be there for us. It's not a maybe. It's not a if you pray hard enough. It's when you press on, when you're going through something, God, we acknowledge that you promised to be there for us. Amen. At this time, please come forward and pray with this team that's so readily available to, to help you out with whatever you need. I am not loved by the measure of love that I bring. I am not who I know. I am known by the King of all kings. Jesus, you are holding the world in your hands you are patient and merciful giver of grace without end satisfied simply by being who you've always been you are in infinite love and you prove it again and again Jesus you are enough Jesus you are enough for me with nothing I still have everything Jesus you are
overcame the grave with you i stand in victory now what else could i need with you Jesus, we thank you for this time of prayer this morning. God, I pray you bless these prayers. God, we lift them all up to you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Give God a praise offering this morning. Let's sing this together. How great the chasm. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Amen. He's our living hope today. Who could imagine? Says Jesus 
Jesus, we lift all this praise and worship up to you this morning. We are so in love with you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll move in this place in such a powerful way. God, change us. Change us so that when we leave this place, we leave this place a new person. God, speak to us. God, I pray that you'll Help shut our minds off and help our ears open up so that we can hear from you. God, thank you so much because you are our living hope. We love you and we give you praise today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give another praise offering this morning. Amen. You have a seat. That's right, that's right, right there, right there, right there, right there. Glad you're here today to celebrate the Kansas City Chiefs victory tour this year. <laughs> Begins today. Um, hey, thank you for choosing Church of Celebration today. We are grateful that you are here and um, it is a thrill to be back up here this week, but our team has just done a tremendous job during this series. Pastor Ben, Pastor Matt, they've done a great job, great, great job, and what an incredible, we've launched some new life groups out of this, which is awesome. A few weeks ago, I, I wasn't here that Sunday, but I heard Ben, if you were here, had everybody weeping about the, the, the marble illustration. Do you remember that one? Raise your hand if you remember that one. What a sucker, dude. Dude, he just reeled you in on that one. Listen, I, I got something even better. I don't have a jar. I have a barrel of marbles in my office. And every week, I don't take out one marble. I take out two marbles and put them in the barrel to remind me how long I'm going to have Caleb. <laughs> Should we just do the invitation right now? Should we just do it? Right? Um. But they've done a tremendous job. We're excited that you're here. And I'm also excited to kind of really push um, our next series that we start next week called Hymns. Wow. How about our seasoned folks out there? Man, this is going to... Hey, listen, I've already been working on this uh, series. And I'm excited because what we're going to do is we're going to take four hymns from uh, the faith of old. And we're going to make some connections to the theological implications that were behind the stories of why those hymns were written. And we're really excited. So come back next week, four-week start. 
But I'm excited to, uh, to basically wrap up today, and we're going to have um, some fun. I feel the Holy Spirit is moving today, amen? I really do. And I, I think it's for a reason, because I really believe today's message is for somebody that needs to hear this today. I really, really, really do. So let me start here. Um, there, there was a book that was written by a gentleman named Hector Tobar, and he wrote it, and he called it The Deep Down Dark. The deep down dark. Now, basically in his book, he recounts the story back in 2010 of the 33 Chilean miners. Do you remember that story? That uh, were actually trapped in the Alta, uh, Altacama region in, in northern Chile. And he talks about uh, in this story about how this giant stone, twice the weight, get this, twice the weight of the Empire State Building. It collapsed and crashed down and blocked the entrance of the mine. And for 69 days, just to kind of refresh your memory, uh, these 33 miners were trapped underground in the dark, in the dark with very, very little food. And they literally didn't know whether or not they were going to live or they were going to die. And he recounts his story, and there was actually a newspaper, believe it or not, in San Diego that gave the probability of survival for these 33 men, 2%. 2% probability of survival. So, as you might assume, um, once this took place and they gathered themselves a little bit, they, they began to very quickly take stock in their lives. And many of them began to think about what they didn't do, and they had a lot of regrets. And then, this kind of surprising moment happened. And the story goes on to say, when they asked one of them by the name of Jose Henriquez, Jose Henriquez, he was a follower of Jesus, they asked him if he would begin to pray. So Jose gets on his knees and he starts to pray, and and some of them kind of follow his lead, and, and he says things like this in his prayer. He says, we aren't the best of men, but but Lord, have pity on us. No one really takes offense at this because they're, again, fearing for their lives. So then he begins to call out guys. I I love this. He goes, Victor Segovia knows he drinks too much. (laughs) Victor Samora, he knows that he is very quick to anger. He said, Pedro Cortez thinks about his poor father and and, and he's been, uh, uh, how bad of a poor father he's been to his young daughter and son. And the most amazing thing happens uh, in this prayer moment and and following. There's this this thing that develops, and it's kind of like a fellowship that develops amongst them. So now these 33 men gather every single day, and, and, and they basically eat this small meal that they rationed out to try to last them as long as they could, and they listen to the teachings of God's word. They even start calling Jose El Pastor. El Pastor. And he tells them Bible story after Bible story. They pray, they worship God, and then another amazing thing happens. They begin to start confessing. They start confessing spontaneously. One of them is praying in the prayer time. He goes, God, forgive me for the way I raised and have abused my body with drugs and alcohol. Another says, God, forgive me for the way that, 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 that I have spoke about this person and that I've raised my hand against them. And, and, and Lord, I, we need you. And extraordinary things begin to happen in the bottom of this mind. Now, all the while, unbeknownst to them, okay, You know the story. I'm just telling you kind of how the the book uh, abbreviates it. While they're doing this, there's this rescue operation that is happening above them on the earth's surface. And there's these eight guys that are a part of this drill unit. And they're going to try to drill down to the miners and begin to try and attempt them. And the amazing thing happens is that the guy that's the head of the drill unit decides, you know, I, I think, guys, we ought to pray. Before we start this. Amazing. So, so they begin to pray. And another guy says, yeah, let's put, let's put all of our trust in the skinny guy. And they're referring to the skinny guy, which is what they knew as the guy that was hanging on a cross. The skinny guy. Let's put all our trust into the skinny guy. And then another says, hey, boss, I, why don't we hold hands while we do this? 
So these eight Chilean, uh, Chilean construction guys are now joining hands. They're praying. They don't even know that at the bottom of the mine, those men are praying. And they start to drill. And they get a hole dug down to the men. And the very first hole was, was somewhat small. It wasn't large enough to rescue. They just wanted to make sure they could do it. And they got down deep enough in order to supply them with some food, with some water, with some, with some uh, supplies. And one of those supplies, you might find out, they sent down iPads. <laughs> iPads. And you might be thinking, what, why would they send down iPads? They sent down the iPads to help these men, thinking they're going stir crazy, and it might help encourage them with communication up to the top, as well as, you know, watching movies or things of that nature. But here's what happens. The miners now begin to believe in the reality that they might actually be saved. They're communicating to the top with their iPads and they're seeing these things. They're seeing these news reports and they're starting to think, man, did you know that we're famous? People all around the world know about us. And some of them begin to think, and it doesn't take long for it to kind of spread amongst the rest of the men, but they're saying, maybe we can get rich off of this when we get out. And the strangest thing happens. They begin to stop meeting together. They begin to stop confessing their sins because... They now have the knowledge that they're going to be okay and saved. They're not as desperate anymore. And the allure of what the world is going to possibly offer them, fame and wealth, it begins to kind of unravel this remarkable community that had developed amongst them. When they were suffering and in some strange way somehow the happiest part of the story their rescue actually became the saddest part of their story in some way they were at their best listen when they were at their worst now Hector Tobar calls this the fellowship of the deep down dark. And the deep down dark is basically a place that I believe many of us know. Many of us have been a part of and in the deep down dark. Many of us um, have yet to be there, but, but we see something on the horizon that is extremely dark, dooming, depressing, and it seems like we're heading there. It's, it's the place in life where you kind of get stuck you ever been there before? It's the place in your life where you start to realize that human sufficiency is, is just not going to cut it anymore. The deep down dark is really the place that you would call, you get so desperate that you realize, I need God. Nobody else but God in this moment. That's the deep down dark. And we've all seen this happen in our lives. All of us have. Somebody binges for the hundredth time, right? They've lost their family. Now they've lost their job. And they know they are going to die if they keep going this way. And, and, and then for some reason they just give it a shot. They stumble into the AA meeting. And, and they find in that AA meeting a place of honesty like they've never seen. Or a place of rawness in that meeting. A fellowship of sorts. You could even call it a community of sorts. And that power then slowly, with some of them, begins to save them. And that power that they've never experienced in their life when things were okay. Somebody gets cancer, right? Somebody gets cancer. You, you've seen this happen. Or you've been, the, been there. And, and somebody suffers a loss. Somebody loses their job. Uh, somebody goes bankrupt. Uh, they lose their reputation. Somebody experiences a broken relationship when, when basically another person has just ripped their hearts out. Here's what I know. Somehow, some way, somewhere, in all of those deep, down, dark places, somebody finds somebody else. Somebody finds a community and they begin to discover things 
that they never had discovered in their life when things seemed to be okay. That, that's, that's the fellowship of the deep down dark. So what I want to do today is I want to talk to you a few moments um, about the fellowship of the deep down dark because I know all of us have been there and it's inevitable that you will be there if you've never been there at some point in your life. You're going to experience that moment. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to just give you four quick observations. Four very quick observations about the fellowship of the deep down dark that maybe you're not aware of that community can offer to you in your moments in which you have deep wounds. And you are, you are dying for healing. That's what I want to talk to you about. So if you're no taker, here you go. Here's the first one. In the fellowship of the deep down dark, community, being connected is non-optional. In the fellowship of the deep down dark, community, being connected is non-optional. We now live in a, in a day and age, and you know this if you have teenagers... Where a lot of people are networked and they're connected almost continuously, nonstop through social media. Right? Yet, here's, here's what's amazing. We know that teenagers are big time into social media. But did you know the spike and rise of teenage depression and suicide attempts and actual suicide accomplished is at an all-time high with teenagers? Like never before. In an age where you're connected, supposedly. Mother Teresa actually said this about loneliness. She said that loneliness is the leprosy of our age. It's lethal. It's lethal to every creature at every level. The truth today is this, folks. If you don't know this, we all were made for community. And we suffer greatly without it. And we suffer greatly without it. Robert Putnam, a researcher, he did the classic study. Uh, he did a classic study on community for our generation. And it was called Bowling Alone. And in his study and book, he found and discovered that isolated people, people that were not in community, were three times more likely to die than people who are embedded in deep communal relationships. His study also revealed this. This is great. I, I, I like this one. People who had bad health habits, i.e. smoking, bad eating habits, obesity, alcohol, but they had strong social ties, lived significantly longer than people who had great health habits and were isolated. In other words, ready? This is why I like this one. It's okay to order a double pepperoni, double cheese pizza and eat it together as opposed to eating it by yourself. Can I get an amen? Yeah. There was another study that was done in the Bay Area. This is unbelievable. It was done specifically to people being connected in community and what it does to your body for your physical well-being. They actually got people who were willing to be infected with the virus of the common cold. And they discovered that people that had strong emotional connections, they were relationally connected, they did four times better fighting off the illness than those who were isolated. Four times. Apparently, apparently the people that were relationally connected produced significantly less mucus than relationally isolated subjects. So it's true. Unfriendly people are snottier than friendly people. <laughs> right? But Putnam also stated... Ben, you're going to like this one. Putnam also stated that if you make no other change in your life, if you don't, if you don't ever start working out, you, you never start eating better, but you join a small group, I told you he's going to like, this is true. If you join a small group, when you were not in a small group before, you actually, get this, cut the odds in half of dying this year. <laughs> I, 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 I talked to Ben, family life pastor here, and I said, we need to change our marketing and pitching life groups. We need to start telling people, join life groups or die.
So just know today, if you're not in a life group and you leave here, you're, hey, you're walking the gauntlet. It's, it's the green mile. Who knows? Today could be your day. You might want to sign up before you leave. There's actually all kinds of statements about this whole idea throughout the Bible. Take this one, for example. The writer of Hebrews said this in chapter 10, verse 24. He said, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together. In essence, the writer of Hebrews basically was literally saying, guys... This is what people do. If you're not in community, you're not normal. That's what he's saying. He's saying life is going to get hard. It's going to get bumpy. There are going to be very difficult moments in your life. And when those happen, don't ever, ever, ever give up meeting together. Don't do it. Please, please listen, friends. Listen, if no one has ever told you today, let me tell you, community... Community, community, community is essential. It is essential to your growth as a follower of Jesus. It is essential. So I'm here to tell you, if it hasn't happened to you in your life today, I promise you it will happen. The deep down dark is coming and it will arrive one day. And if you are not in community, you're going to have a hard time. But if you are in community, you will navigate that moment in your life so much better than if you were alone. You were created for community. You were created for community. Why don't you just say that out loud on the count of three. I am created for community. One, two, three. I am created for community. Community is non-optional. It is non-optional. Here's the second one. Second observation in the fellowship of the deep down dark. People are non-optimal. People are non-optimal. A lot of times, here's what happens, we finally say yes and we get into a life group or a Christian community, right? This is what's kept a lot of people out of church for the longest time because they're like, people are weird in there. People are strange in there. And it keeps you from going to church until you actually walk into one like Church of Celebration, which rocks. And you're like, people aren't really that weird, right? The pastor wears flip-flops. He's got holes in his jeans. He wears a jersey on NFL day one, right? He wears actually the best jersey in the NFL on day one. But you do think things like this, like people are going to be great. They're going to be mature. So you've got these expectations built up. They're going to be spiritually healthy. They're going to agree with me. They're going to make me feel really great about myself. And then you get into a Christian community and you're like, what in the world have I done? Because you start realizing that everyone is not optimal. perform has something that's not most desirable or satisfactory about them. It's just a fact. I know that shocks you because you look at me and you're like, that's got to be a joke because you, you are most satisfactory and desirable, Pastor Josh. Where was your amen? But people are non, uh, listen, I'm a pastor. I am a pastor, and there are moments in my life, I'm just going to be honest and raw, there are moments in my life I hate people. Can you believe that? I've got a meme, I've got a meme of a picture of a, of a book that I say every pastor has to have, and the book title says, People I Want to Punch in the Face. That, and it's got names in it. It's got names in it. Here, listen, we're all 
messed up. Remember our How to Hug a Vampire series? We told you. We clarified all that up. We all suck. We all suck, right? What I'm saying, and don't take this in a negative way. Don't, don't take this in a negative way today, okay? What I'm trying to help you understand is this. Nobody, nobody, nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect, right? Everybody's welcome, for sure, but nobody's perfect. The Apostle Paul even suggested this very idea when he wrote in Romans chapter 15 to the, to the uh, Roman church. Listen, he said, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you. Do you know what he's saying in that moment? He's basically, he's basically telling them, how did Christ accept you? You were weird, you were messed up, you were imperfect, you were flawed, but he still accepted you, idiot, hashtag idiot. Paul should have hashtagged it right there. And why do we do this? To bring praise to God. We do this because we experience community when we extend community to any and all. And when we do that, God is honored, he is glorified, he is lifted up. That, that's, that's why we do it. So, so I'm here to tell you, listen, authentic biblical community. It's always, always, always going to be with messed up people. It is. Who are sometimes hard for you to get along with. They are non-optimal. People are different from one another. That's why we kind of joke when we talk about a series of like, I like you more if you were more like me. We laugh at it because it's funny, but we know it's true. We know it's true. Here's the deal. This is why this idea is sometimes tricky for us, right? If I choose to actually get into a life group and do community with people, everyone in that group seems to have these romanticized ideas, right? About life and things. And then it gets really hard. Somebody in your group is snarky and sketchy like Ginger. And someone <laughs> in there... Ser seriously, someone in there always likes to talk politics at a church group. And you're like, come on, please. Can we just not do and, and then with me, any life group that I've ever been a part of, except the one that I'm in right now because I've already told them in advance. But somebody always wants to talk theology. Are you serious? I don't want to talk the. I want to do life. I want to do community. I don't want to talk theology with you in this moment. Someone talks too much. Someone never talks at all. And you're wondering, why are you even here? Why? Why? Why are you even here? here? Here's the reality. Get this point, ready? Christian community, real biblical Christian community doesn't mean you always get to be with people who are easy to be with. Period. Period. But here's the beautiful part. It does mean that you actually get to be with Jesus, which I think is pretty cool. Because Jesus even said so in Matthew 18. He said, where two or three are gathered, there I am also. Which means if I gather with some of those non-optimal people, that's cool. Because God's still there and I get to meet with him. Amen. Sign me up. Sign me up. Amen. The biblical community isn't exclusive. It's all inclusive. And in the deep down dark, people are optimal. People are optimal. Bottom line. Hey, one more side note with this whole idea, and we'll move on to the third one. If you have a problem with this one, you're going to have a real problem in heaven. Just so you know. Right? You're going to be living all by yourself in like the hidden valley of, of, <laughs> of heaven. All by yourself. All right? Not a slam to my hidden valley folks. I love you. If you're from hidden valley, you're awesome. You're awesome. All right. Here's a third observation in the fellowship of the deep down dark. Honesty is non-negotiable. Honesty is non-negotiable. Friends, I talk to people so many times, and Andy and Nancy and I visit, and it seems like this epidemic of depression and anxiety is just sweeping our world nonstop. And usually the root thing that comes is like the, 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 the stimulator of your depression or anxiety, which I'm not demeaning, it's real. It's real. But the one thing that you need to understand that is driving your 
depression, your anxiety, your feelings of constant overwhelming. If you're alone today, you need to know the power that is feeding that is loneliness. It's loneliness. And it's coming from your inability and your lack of being ready, vulnerable, and honest. Do you know how hard it is to talk to someone that is in deep depression or anxiety and try to get out from them what is bothering them? It takes years sometimes because they can't get it out. And I'm here to tell you today, if you suffer from that anxiety and depression in your life and you're feeling lonely, it is coming. I promise you, it is coming because you are operating opposite of how you were created. It is coming from your inability at this point in time or your lack of ability to be vulnerable and honest. That, that is the step towards, towards moving on in that area. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this about honesty. He said, in confession, the breakthrough to community takes place. He goes on to say, the mask you wear before men will do you no good before them. You do not have to go on lying to yourself and your brothers. And he says that, I love this last part, you can actually dare to be a sinner. You can actually dare to just acknowledge the fact that you're a sinner. This, this is a cheesy analogy, uh, analogy, but it drives home this point. There, there was this guy, really super desperate for a job. He was looking everywhere. He couldn't find anything. And then he sees this newspaper article or ad, and it says it's promoting a job at the zoo. And, and, and he's like, hey, that's interesting. I'll go check it out. He goes to the zoo, and he talks to the guy in charge. And the guy says, this job's kind of a little unusual, but here's what happened. Our gorilla died, okay? And we can't really afford to get a new one or a real gorilla. So we want you to put on the gorilla suit. And we just want you to go out and display during public hours and just act like a gorilla. And he's like, well, that's kind of humiliating. But I'm broke, so I'll give it a shot. So he tries it, and he actually starts doing this, and he's making money. And something to his amazement is people actually start loving it. They really like it. And, and he's learning all these tricks and, and loving it. And one day he's doing so fantastic that he's swinging from vine to vine to vine. And, 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 and he just kind of lets go of one vine. People are laughing. They're loving him. And he flips over into the cage next to him, which is the lion's. And in this moment, now he starts freaking out and people are watching this. And all of a sudden they hear a human voice coming out of this man saying, Get me out of here! Get me out of here! Help! 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 And as you would expect it, the lion jumps on top of him and whispers, Would you shut up or you're going to get us both kicked out of here? How in the world do you get spiritual after that? <laughs> Listen, here's, here's my point. Many, 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 many people, more than not, probably even you, are wearing masks. You're wearing disguises. And you're saying, I'm good. I'm doing great. I love it. Failure doesn't opt. Uh, you know, bother me, look at me, look at me, I have a happy mask. Hey, listen, I'm here to tell you I've been in this business for a long time. Oh, man, Sundays are the best mask-wearing days there are. Because before you came out of church today, you got in a fight, you threatened to kill you, right? You've even already had two drinks before you even got here. Some of you even popped a pill or two before you got here. Just to eat. You grabbed what I would call your holy mask. Just to let everybody know, I'm good. Praise Jesus. Right? Right? And here's what's the problem with wearing a mask. You enjoy wearing that mask because if you wear it long enough, you start to actually enjoy it. And then soon, here's what's crazy. You start actually becoming judgmental and critical of other people all while forgetting you're not even real yourself because you're wearing a mask as well. Bonhoeffer suggests something the Bible does as well. He says, confess your faults to one another. Th this is what they actually found in the deep down dark. That became real and authentic. 
They didn't become lonely because they began to confess their faults to one another. And he continued to write, Bonhoeffer, and he said, He who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. The final breakthrough, the final breakthrough to true, authentic fellowship and community will never, ever, ever occur in your life without transparency and honesty. It just won't. True, authentic, biblical fellowship and community will only occur when we all come to the point of realizing that I'm no better than you and we're just all sinners. And some of us happen to be saved by Jesus. And now my goal in life is to tell other sinners how they can be saved as well. There is no, I'm telling there's so, so, so much power in full disclosure, openness and honesty. There really is. It's okay, guys, and, and listen, I'm, I'm not justifying your sins. Listen to me when I say this. It's okay to just acknowledge the fact that you're a sinner. It's okay. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. But the longer you keep wearing that mask and acting as if you don't need the help and you don't need anything, you keep hiding, you, you will keep yourself from fully being known. It's only when you're fully known that you can actually be fully loved. It is. Community is a place where honesty is non-negotiable, especially in the deep down dark. Here's the fourth one. Ready? In the fellowship of the deep down dark, hope is non-perishable. In the fellowship of the deep down dark, number four, hope is non-perishable. The deep down dark in that mine where those Chilean miners were, they began to love one another and get together. And they would love to have El Pastor, El Pastor tell them stories in the Bible. They would love it. They would love it. Their favorite story in the Bible was when El Pastor would talk to them about Jonah and the whale. Because they actually began believing, hey, listen, if God could save Jonah in the belly of a whale, he could actually save us, possibly. It gave them a hope. It gave them a spark. Regardless, regardless. And, and basically, what you need to understand is, is this, and hope is non-perishable. In order for you to keep hope alive in your life, you've got to learn how to give hope away. In order for you to keep hope alive inside of you, you've got to learn to give hope it away. This is a strange idea surrounding love. I've seen it over and over and over again in my ministry. Years. I've experienced this personally. But when I focus, when my focus is all about me, and I get consumed with me, am I going to be okay? For some reason, things always get worse. I begin getting suffocated by my own loneliness. But when I'm with other people, even if I have to ginger noses, even if I have to force myself to be with other people, which I don't like doing. I already told you, some of you are in a book that I have. <laughs> There's always something strange that comes. And it manifests itself with hope. 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 In those moments when I'm finally become vulnerable, raw, and honest, it's like hope comes to me. Hope comes to me. We, and this is hard. This is a tricky one because, guys, we live. We live in a world that is constantly barraging you with false hopes and shallow hopes. And we'll often say to people things like, well, that's unfortunate, but i got to believe that everything's going to turn out okay. I'm sure it will work out in the end, and you'll eventually get what you, wrong, get what you want. And, and, but we fail to just kind of say this to that person, right? We, we fail to, at the end of that, say, maybe. We want them to have the hope, but we sell it and don't even tell them that's actually a maybe. Maybe things will actually work out. Friends, that's... Not the foundation of hope that's found in the deep down dark of real community. The writer of Hebrews from our earlier verse goes on to say this in verses 24 through 25. He says, let us consider how we, spur, how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some of us are in the habit of doing. You just got called out if you come to church 2.3 times a month right there. But encouraging one another... And all the more, I love this part, and all the more as you see, keywords, 
The day coming. The day approaching. So the writer says, and he encourages us, uh, us one another, to, to meet together one another, but not based on maybes. He says you need to base your meeting together on this. As you see the day approaching. Now, naturally, if you're not... If you're kind of new to the Bible, you might not understand what is he referring to by this, the day. The, the day is really clear to the guy that's writing this and the people that are reading this in the beginning. But he doesn't really say what is the day. What is the day? What's the day that we're supposed to be looking for? What's the day that we're supposed to hope for? What's the day that we're waiting for? And as I began to think about this idea a little bit more, I started to think about some days that are very important to us in our lives. Just, just, I tried to, you know, get some common ground here. After working a long, hard week, most of us, uh, many of us will say, thank God it's fry. Yeah, right, so, so that's a big deal, right? After the weekend is over and it was awesome, we're like, oh my gosh, Mun is here. Already. And then halfway through the week, we call that hump day, Right? There's several other days that are really important and monumental in all of our lives. There's no doubt about that. Um, There's a birth day, right? There's the first day of school for all of our, which parents are like, praise Jesus on that one, right? And then all the kids are like, but there's also a last day of the school. There's graduation day, right? There's work day. And then that leads you to what? Retirement day, All of these are monumental days in our life, but none of them, none of them are the days that the writer of Hebrews is is writing about. So what is the day that is approaching, that he's saying? Here's, Here's the day. A long time ago, there was a small group, a small community of guys that gathered together, and there was this one guy that would teach them. And he would tell them stories and life lessons like nobody ever told. But then one day they hung this skinny guy on a cross. And they killed him. And he died for your sin and he died for my sin. And then they buried him and they put him inside the earth and they placed in front of it A huge, immovable stone. But unbeknownst to everyone here on earth, where this skinny guy was trapped in the earth, way up above where nobody else could see, there was a little rescue operation that was taking place. And the Heavenly Father came down and he entered into that tomb and he met his crucified son. And it was there, that first meeting in the deep down dark, that the stone was rolled away and Jesus got up. And that's known as the resurrection day. Okay? But that's past tense because we know that happened. So what is the day? Here's the day, friends. There's going to be another resurrection day. No, 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 no. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to wave this thing and start spitting if you don't get excited on this one. (laughs) The original resurrection day, we can remember, but we look forward to the next coming resurrection day. So here's what it is all about and what we're trying to grapple with. When you hope when you read your Bible, when you gather together in community with other Christians and you get encouraged, you get encouraged, and when you get direction from being forgiven and you receive the grace of God, do you know what you're doing? You are seeing that day eventually coming. You are looking forward to that day which is approaching. That's where our hope lies. Our hope actually lies in the fellowship. Of the deep, down, dark. A place where hope is non-perishable. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes today? Stand to your feet with me. No one looking around. I want to be very clear this morning for you today, friends. I preached this message in 42 minutes. Which is a rarity for me. It has nothing to do 
with it being opening day of NFL and me wanting to get home. It doesn't. But I want you to be very clear if you have gotten anything I've said today, I want you to understand this. Because this is where a lot of people are falling for false hope in your life. Your hope is not and will never not be found in any human circumstance. And that is what many of us are searching desperately for. Hope in our lives in human circumstances. It won't. Your hope is not in whether or not the girl will say yes to you. Your hope is not in that that school might accept you. Your hope is not in the job that might come through. Your hope is not that your house will appreciate. Your hope is not that your 401k will be, will be huge one day. Your hope, is not, your hope is not in the whale hopefully going to deliver you up to the surface. Your hope is not that the drill team is going to make it through to you in time. Your hope is in Jesus Christ. The skinny guy on the cross who was crucified for your sins, later resurrected, and the day that's coming in which you will be resurrected too. That's where your hope is truly found. All heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Listen, friends, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today, you're searching, chances are, for a false hope. And the closest picture that you could ever get to understanding and truly knowing who Jesus is is through biblical community. It's when you fellowship with other people that are just like you, a sinner, in the deep down dark, and you live to be raw, vulnerable, transparent, open, and honest. That is when you start growing in your relationship with Jesus. Too many of us here today are wearing masks. And your life is going to go on being miserable until you take off your mask and you embrace where you're at in life. You're a part of the fellowship of the deep down dark. If you don't know Jesus today as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm, gonna be I'm begging you, please, do not leave today without coming forward during this last song and telling one of our What's Next counselors at the front, tell them simply this, I don't know for sure that I have a personal relationship with Jesus. And they would love, they would love to introduce you to Jesus Christ today. Please don't leave here today with that that happening. Don't live your life anymore for a false hope. Please consider putting a faith, a hope, a trust in the skinny guy that loves you more than you could ever imagine. Especially, God loves, especially loves you in the deep down dark places of your life. That's what's amazing. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. We pray that you would be glorified today. I pray that today somebody that's sitting in this room would, be, would have the courage to take a step forward and cross over from death to life. I pray for my brothers and sisters that are wearing a mask right now and they are sweating profusely behind that mask. And they are miserable right now because this message through the Holy Spirit came on, came, came at them like a Mack truck. God, I love them, but I pray that you would keep making them miserable until they would make things right. Because that's the only place that they're going to be and find more hope. Move today as we worship you in this closing song. We give you all the praise in your precious and your holy, holy, holy son's name and all God's people said. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory
Josh. Next week, we start a new series, hymn series. It's going to be awesome. Don't forget to come back. And if you have any cards or envelopes in the baskets, go ahead and set them in the way on your way out. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.